Well, it's wonderful to see everybody here still, as Janet says, so energized and enthused and eager to hear what we're about to hear. Um, I will just uh, echo her welcoming remarks uh, to this panel, this, the last panel of really an extraordinary two days in honor of BCRW's 40th anniversary. So I want to begin just very briefly with congratulations and thanks. Um, as Janet says, for many years I was director of the Institute for Research on Women and Gender at Columbia, the sister organization, as I like to think of it, of BCRW, uh, a term that doesn't always get used when Columbia refers to itself, but uh, we, uh, it, a sister organi organization in the sense of being a long-term collaborator on pedagogical and programmatic projects. From my vantage point, BCRW has always been a model and having worked with and observed its many activities over the years, I'm always confident that anything undertaken at BCRW will be marked by excellence, openness, and intellectual courage. And my confidence has obviously been repaid by this conference, which is a kind of marvel of organizational, intellectual, and ethico-political commitment. So hats off to Janet Jacobson, Elizabeth Castelli, and Catherine Same. for their good and necessary labors. Just over your applause. Elizabeth Castelli, Janet Jacobson, and Catherine Same. Um, hats off to Deborah Spar for supporting and enlivening this crucial locus of learning and collegial exchange. Hats off to Kim Hall and Yvette Christiansa for working to assemble this final panel and for helping to make Africa central and not a secondary thought for feminist work in the world and here. I. And I want, um, some of you know that I'm here in a sort of a pinch-hitting role. Hopefully I'll do better here than I do at baseball. I want to convey to you uh, Professor Christiansa's deep regret at not being able to join you today. She was grief-struck about the schedule conflict that kept her from attending and especially from hearing the words of our esteemed plenary lecturer this morning, Dr. Marampelli. After conversations about issues as diverse as social justice and civic engagement, gender and sexuality studies, writing and new media, archives, feminist ethnography, but also gender violence in the borderlands, transnational feminisms across the Americas, and the nature of campus activism. We conclude with a set of conversations entitled um, uh, Building and Rebuilding Societies in Africa. We began our day with an extraordinary and inspiring lecture by Dr. Mampele Rampele, and heard from her about the necessity for a second transition in South Africa, what in the old days we might have called a permanent revolution. But unlike the discourse of permanent revolution, which comes so very easily to our lips and so very stubbornly to our minds, Dr. Rampele's vision of transformation is without violence, in which patriarchal forms give way to transformational politics that are neither vanguardist nor amenable to being hijacked by a future elite. She lay the blame for our current woes at the feet of global capital, but also at the feet of those who see transition as an opportunity to enhance their own power positions, rather than address the need for structural transformation. Now, the relationship between constitutional and legal change on one hand and socio-political and ideological transformation on the other is one of the issues that we'll discuss in this afternoon's panel, and there will be others. But before we begin, and I'm not going to say any more about the content of it, I just want to say a little bit about the format and introduce our esteemed speakers. And unfortunately, I have to begin with a statement of regret that Christine Karumba from the Democratic Republic of the Congo cannot be here as she was billed to because she was unable to obtain a visa to enter the United States. Now, those of us who organize international conferences are sadly, tragically, used to these enormous disappointments. But this does not mean that they should go unremarked. For as we speak about enhancing access to our institutions, and as we work to produce a substantial and just response to globalization, we cannot ignore the very different economies of access that cross-cut the otherwise apparently more fluid space of globality. The freedom and mobility that we seek as the perk of technological and informational borderlessness is to be grasped against the histories of coerced migration and enforced immobility. 
And that immobility is, of course, uh, uh, horribly experienced by Christine in relationship to this conference. As you know from the remarks yesterday, she was asked to prove that she would not try to stay here illegally because, of course, illegal immigrants have such great opportunities here. Um, Christine is, uh, is nonetheless uh, a woman of great accomplishment who needs to be recognized as the country director of women for Women's International in the DRC. She's worked with numerous international NGOs and has a degree from the Institute of Rural Development in Bukavu, DRC. Uh, therefore, of course, her absence is all the more disappointing. In Christine's absence, however, we also have two other uh, wonderful conversations planned for you. And we will um, pursue them individually before bringing them together in the larger framework of the, uh, uh, in indicated by the panel's title. In the first of these, we'll hear from Rabab Al-Madi and Laila Abulugod, who will speak about social movements, gender and transformational politics, and perhaps other things in North Africa and particularly Egypt. In the second conversation, we will hear Penny Andrews and Jane Bennett speak about issues pertaining to South Africa's history and the tasks now faced in effecting that second transition of which Dr. Mampele spoke this morning. I'll make some brief remarks at the end of those conversations to try and link them together. Our panelists will then ask questions of each other, and then we will open it out to you so that you will have an opportunity to ask questions, to bring forward issues and concerns from earlier panels, and or to take this back to your own worlds and your own projects. Um, very briefly, Rabab al Madi is a scholar and activist who has been particularly involved in democratic movements in Egypt, working for organizations such as the Kafaya Pro-Democracy Movement and the National Front for Democracy and Social Justice, as well as Women for Justice, excuse me. She's an assistant professor of political science at American University in Cairo and co-editor of the prescient Egypt, The Moment of Change, published in 2009 by Zed Books. Laila Abulukod is an anthropologist and holds the Joseph L. Buttenweiser Professorship in Anthropology at Columbia University. She has written extensively on forms of culture and power in Egypt, on feminism in the Middle East, and on the Palestinian experiences of the Nakba. She is also a former director of the Institute for Research on Women and Gender at Columbia and a fellow traveler in our shared projects. Penny Andrews is associate dean and professor of law at the CUNY Law School. Originally from Cape Town, she has written extensively on constitutional and human rights issues in South Africa, Australia, and in the international arena. She is especially interested in gender and human rights law and on the status of racial minorities within different legal frameworks. And finally, Jane Bennett is the head of the African Gender Institute at the University of Cape Town and a frequent visitor and friend at Barnard College. She has been crucially involved in the establishment of networks of feminist scholars in Africa and elsewhere. Her own scholarship focuses on feminist theory, sexualities, pedagogies, and violence. And I should say that she has been a really indefatigable force in the development of um, networks, NGO networks, in. Uh, Eastern and, and Southern African contexts. As I said, my job is not to preempt the conversation. Uh, my real task is to function as a clock. And uh, I will try to do that with as little ticking as possible. But I will ask our first uh, conversational partners, uh, Rabab Almadi and Alala Abulgod, to begin their conversation with us now. Thank you, Roz. Can everybody hear? Thank you all for being here uh, this late. And um, I wanted to just explain why when Janet uh, asked me with whom I'd like to have a conversation uh, on what was happening in Egypt, I answered immediately that I'd like it to be Rabab al-Mahdi. Uh, not only is Rabab this perfect combination of activist and scholar, but I personally had learned so much from her uh, when I was doing research on feminist NGOs and women's activism in Egypt. Uh, you know, my work is usually in the countryside, but as part of my project on the circulation of discourses and practices of Muslim women's rights, I knew I had to look at actual organizations um, that were working in the name of this thing, and they tend to be in Cairo. So Rabab was an excellent guide, uh, knowledgeable, involved, and like me, thinking critically about something that we both support and worry deeply about. So then I knew um, that she would be and was in Tahrir Square and involved in the revolution, and who better to give us insight 
into what happened, what it meant, uh, and what to think especially about the difference between the media coverage and representations of what happened and what was happening on the ground in various circles and the various forces shaping this revolution. What I didn't know uh, at the time that I suggested this, uh, because I was actually traveling around a lot and not as glued to the TV and newspapers as other people were, was what a media figure she had turned out to be. And she told me last night that when she got into a cab in Washington, D.C. recently, the Ethiopian taxi driver said, I recognize you. And she said, come on. <laughs> Hi, you know. <laughs> That's not good. That's not no, no, listen, why? why? No, I'm go? sorry. No, but listen, to, we'll come back to faces okay. in a minute. She was very surprised, very polite. Oh, come on, you know. And he said, you're the face of the Egyptian revolution, which is <laughs> not at all what she would want yeah. and something that she thinks a lot about. So I want to ask you about some of those aspects of media and representation. So we're thrilled to have... Um, one face of the Egyptian revolution here, face to face. And I wanted uh, to kind of uh, ask some questions just to hear her on a range of subjects, and we'll see how much time we have. Uh, but specifically two, one is uh, the involvement of women and the whole question of feminism. The second is uh, this notion of a Facebook revolution. So let me begin with the first question about women and the revolution because this is the theme of the conference, uh, but both of us, I think, think a lot about how women's activism can't escape the symbolic significance of the Middle Eastern or the Muslim woman question. And both of us are constantly asked to comment on women in the Egyptian revolution, and both of us are incredibly annoyed by this question. So, like, why are we so annoyed by this question? Um, uh, so, how do you think about this relationship between actually actual women's involvement and participation versus or in relation to a Western obsession uh, and media obsession with what the uprising means for women? Um, you know, and sort of to learn from you, really, how do you handle the question? Because I just always say, no, I won't do an interview which, you know, it's not that helpful. Uh, but what do you think, you know, you've thought about it a lot, what lies behind these questions? And from your own activist work, is there a way to think concretely about women's participation without that way that it will get represented? So I think... Um, I'm honored to be here and sharing uh, this with uh, Layla and the other panelists. Uh, Layla um, and Tim are two <laughs> of... Uh, very few academics that I really respect uh, because of their politics, <laughs> because of their writings. And uh, I know it's not helpful to say this when you're in an academic thing, but yeah. Um, but just, uh, um, I want to thank Janet and the center for uh, giving me that um, opportunity. However, uh, j just some cautionary notes. I wouldn't be here. Uh, as sort of the face. I know when, when Layla thinks of me, she doesn't think of me in that reductionist way of you know, being the face. But again, I think one of the things that we need to be thinking about is um, if I didn't have the English, if I wasn't you know, doing the publishing, if, would I be here? Would the Ethiopian uh, guy recognize me as the uh, face? Plus, I am not in any way, shape, or form even uh, remotely representative of the majority of Egyptian women, right? Leila knows this um, very well. You guys would know this. Like, I mean, how many Egyptian women are as privileged to get that chance to be here? Um, so I think this is um, whatever I say today. Uh, we will just have to collectively think about and, and take with a, with a grudge. Um, um, so... Back to your question. I think the, the first thing that comes up to the first time I heard that question was on the 29th. And would, it of was January. all of January. And, <laughs> sorry, so sorry. You have to remember sorry. That. Everybody, I, knows, that, like, everybody like, knows every minute every, of the Egyptian yeah, uprising. And, and yeah. everything starts in like uh, January 2011 is like history for me. So, like, everything I really refer to is like sort of, I assume that people have the same point of reference, which, which, <laughs> Is not the case. Um, 
we had been beaten up, we were on the street, and then this a woman, and interest, interestingly, she's not just you know one lame journalist. Um, she's a friend, she's a comrade, she's very active in Britain, and she's uh, the editor of uh, the Social Worker paper. And she calls me for an interview about you know how are women doing uh, in what at that time was not still framed as a revolution. And I'm like, seriously, is this what you think we should be asking me now? And I hung up on her. Uh, yeah. And later on, when she came to Cairo, she's like, uh, and what I heard, and this question came, came uh, coming up again, and I, I always wonder if, if this has happened, if this revolution uprising, whatever you want to call it, if it happened in Germany or Austria, would we ask, you know, what, was the ro what is the role of the Austrian women or the German women? And, and I don't, and, and the take that my friend had was like, yes, as a feminist, you should be asking because women has a specific position and what they do and what, how it affects them is applicable wherever you are. But what I was hearing is that, oh, really, in this um, country where the majority of women are Muslim and wear the hijab, they were on the street? How so lovely. Just like the Arab awakening, as if we were dead before, as if they weren't in the, yeah. As, as if they weren't in the public space and doing things. So suddenly they see those images and wow, they could get out of the burqa and the haram and be on the street. And I'm like, no. Um, and, and what it's dismissing actually, and this, is, uh, this would be my last part so that you can m move on, um, is the fact that women have been involved throughout. They're just not, involved in the kind of things that Western media specifically would like to define as feminist. So the, the spearheading the labor movement in Egypt, which has been going on and, and, and up, up till now, more than 1.8 million people have been engaged in uh, job, one form or another of job action, spearheading it are women, who in Mahalla came out to say, home. And that's how, the women are here. <laughs> where, where, where are the men? Yeah. Um, women have been involved in the Islamist movement, be it the Muslim Brotherhood, be it something like Al Adl. Some of the most fascinating women I've ever met in terms of feminist consciousness, strong women I've ever met in my life. I met in Morocco when I was um, interviewing people from Al Adl al Ihsan. Fascinating work, fascinating ideas. Uh, but this is not considered feminist um, enough because of the umbrella they, they work under. Same thing um, in Egypt. Women have been involved in the pro-democracy uh, movement from the start. You know, people like Aida Sefid Dawla and others. Those are the ones who actually uh, shouldered that movement. But again, if they do not, um, if it doesn't look a, a certain way and that they define that their mobilization is about gen their gender identity uh, very narrowly defined, then it's not feminist. And I think it pushes us to re-question, re which, which I think we've done in academia, but still within mainstream media, it, it hasn't been done. What do we mean by feminist in a, in a, with a number of S's, so plural. Thanks. Well, following up a little bit still on this theme, though, uh, this is great. I uh, was um, thinking about those feminists in Egypt who had the label feminists, and I've written in, thanks in part to what you taught me, but uh, I've ar ar argued that in Egypt over the last couple of decades there has been what we've found many places in the world, a serious NGO NGOization of uh, women's movement, women's rights work with lots of foreign funding, there's been a strong governmentalization, I didn't know a better word for that, of, okay. what's, um, of women's rights work and a kind of takeover by, uh, of resources for this kind of thing and a co-optation of people by uh, Suzanne Mubarak, the uh, wife of um, uh, President Mubarak, ex-President ex Mubarak, and her Council on Women or whatever it was called. It was a huge thing with all these resources sort of got sucked up into it. And 
uh, you had to play with it if you wanted to do women's rights work. And I also talked about a third trend that I saw in Egypt, um, which was what I called the commercialization of women's rights work, where um, uh, people got involved in issues that were sort of depoliticized. They were only on a kind of gender level, and they were catchy, and you know everybody could support them, like the uh, uh, campaign against street harassment which had the funding of you know, Moby Neal, all the t uh, t you know, private telecom companies, all these businesses, every, it was a like, corporately yeah. sponsored project because you were supposed to SMS when you got harassed on the street and they were gonna have maps and things lit up. You know, and uh, Whereas there are uh, feminist groups who've been working a long time on things like that, but they link them to uh, police brutality, they link it to torture in prison, things like that, but those weren't the people that got funded for this kind of thing that could be the face of Moby Neal, I can't remember which companies were involved. So there were these kinds of three processes. Um, and uh, I now wonder uh, what happened to those people uh, who were involved in those organizations, what are they doing now, and what were the consequences, you know, uh, if you can tell us a little bit about what the mainstream sort of feminist activists in those different worlds are doing and what you think, uh, you know, I mean, be careful, but what, you know, where you would want to see yourself going or where you see uh, maybe uh, them going in the wrong direction or the right direction. I wouldn't use their names, yeah. Yeah, no, no, don't use their names. names. But um, I think it's a, it's a real issue because this is absolutely. a common, you know, uh, situation, not just in Egypt, many parts of the, you know, Africa <laughs> and, and third world, yeah. Absolutely. I think we're, um, we're, we're currently facing a backlash in terms of um, women's legal rights in Egypt, right? So um, the things to do with, the, with marriage laws, for example, are being attacked. The quota in the parliament is being attacked. But the interesting thing, as, as a feminist, I'm not sure that they are being attacked for the wrong reasons. Let me explain. So all those, um, all those laws or rights that we supposedly gained were pushed on the agenda by Suzanne Mubarak. And again, this is very common throughout the Arab world, where we find the Amira Basma, where we find the Rania in Jordan. They, they have to be Moza in Bahrain, whatever. So anything that has to do with women, um, is sort of, um, in terms of legal rights, they just chaperone somehow. And now that we see that backlash, those laws in Egypt, like the quota in the parliament and the marriage law, are being seen as Suzanne Mubarak laws in reference to uh, uh, the wife of the ex-president. And here am I not, not knowing what to do about this. Because I think those are real rights, and they're very important for women to have. Forget about you know, the, you know, how elitist some of those things are, because how many, what kind of women end up in the parliament and whatnot. But still, I think there are legal rights that need to be maintained. So there's a real dilemma, because as a, as a pro-democracy activist, I think, yes, rightly, I would not want to support anything that has been pushed um, on the agenda by those people. But as a feminist, I think those are rights we have to maintain. And the only lesson I take out of this is the kind of, uh, what you say in, in your work, which is that it has been very problematic, the kind of, the easy way out, the, the so-called feminists in the Arab world um, went through, which is in, in, instead of trying to build from the bottom up to reach those rights as acquired rights through a mass movement to actually try to lobby dictators to push them on the agenda. And those are very different things because lobby, how lobbying works in a place like the US, for example, which I don't know much about, but my understanding is that it's one of the political activities and supposedly it's an open political system, so it has a different meaning. But what it means there um, in a place like Egypt is that you went to bed with, with the regime, mm. with the same regime that actually brutally harassed women, kicked them out of their land. I mean, and my real problem with them is that we're not learning the lesson. Those, the, this uh, uh, circle of feminists is not le learning the lesson. So what we're seeing now is that 
they're doing the same thing. They're trying to lobby the, the military council, which is in power, which is an equal uh, uh, dictatorship as the Mubarak regime, to actually maintain those um, laws and rights instead of, or focus on having certain things in the, in the Constitution. Instead of trying to build a mass movement that will force whoever is in power to, to legalize uh, uh, those rights. Mm. And you find that they're equally, as, as much as the media thing that we talked about, they're equally dismissive of what, of forms of women mobilization and agency that they don't think of as feminist enough for them. So women fighting um, against evacuation from land, pe peasant farmers, uh, women. This is something that no one talks about. Unlike the people, the Adl al Ihsan in Morocco, mm. for example. Um, things like um, women, domestic help and the abuse domestic help, which is predominantly female in Egypt, is this is not because there's no funding for this, and it's not cool enough. Like the map and the uh, and there's very some, something very orientalist about the kind of uh, topics they choose. Yani, I think the whole the harassment I can all totally understand. I I get subjected to this. But there is something about the woman body in the public space that they fetishize in a certain way that I'm not comfortable with. Because women are being harassed in, in, in police stations, in, but it's not as sexy for the funding as the whole closed society in which people wear the veil, but they still get harassed, and mm. the kind of thing that Nihad Abul Umsan loves. Mm. I thought you weren't going to mention any names. I just can't. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, so there are a lot of people missing from the story. How are we doing in terms of time? Just one more question. One more? Okay. And then this is my uh, cynical one. Yeah, that, that wasn't a cynical one. Um, I wanted to come back to another uh, thing that's been sort of uh, troubling me, and I just don't know enough about it, but another key aspect of the kind of media and Western representation of this revolution, uh, which is um, the languages that I'm hearing about it, or the languages we hear from it, uh, amplified. Peace, it's a peaceful one, uh, democracy, human rights, and you've been involved in the democ pro-democracy movement. Uh, what are the faces that are seen? It's called the Facebook revolution, and that's educated, cosmopolitan, middle-class youth. What groups are being ignored uh, or excluded from uh, our representations of what happened in Tahrir and elsewhere in Egypt? What political languages are being spoken that uh, may not be heard, um, but that were actually perhaps really critical to the events? Uh, you know, and I know you were there, and I know it was a you know it's always these kinds of things are huge, and they are complex, and they involve a lot of people. Um, but so what I've been worrying about in the kind of democracy aspect, uh, Facebook side of this is, um, I don't know how to, I mean, it seemed, sounded to me when I heard that amplified that this was sort of the mildest, least theorized revolution that I could think of you know, perfectly compatible with key liberal terms or empty slogans of good governance, democracy, human rights, that kind of thing. And I just didn't see the claws or the fangs or, you know, what it, I don't know what that's, those are like bad images for that, but, you know, where's the vision? Where's the understanding, you know, class struggle or, you know, various other things. No, not been much critique of alliance with the U.S. You know, here's the military council in charge, you know, who, who funds them? Um, so, uh, and I began to wonder, and some people heard me on this the other day, you know, and I really want your reaction, because um, I wondered what the connection was between that, not just in you know, what we want to hear in the West, but um, things that were actually being funded on the ground uh, that are sometimes called soft intervention, cultural diplomacy, that I'd just been reading about lately. Um, how did they affect, actually, the youth, not just, you know, uh, what's who gets to who we get to hear, but actually the ways people on the ground in certain circles see what they're doing and what they want. And the two things that I've been reading about um, was one is called the U.S. Uh, uh, the Middle East Partnership Initiative of the U.S. State Department, which has been going on for a decade. 
con making partnerships between the U.S. private sector and non NGOs in the Middle East and North Africa, right? And they want civil society, they want political participation, they want to empower women, they want to empower youth, they want to create civic educational opportunities, and they want to support media. In and the latest project was something on how to use Facebook and digital technologies to make connections and so forth. So that's one. And then the other initiative that I uh, heard about, read about um, recently through a colleague who's a, at, um, in Beirut, uh, she worked on these public relations campaigns, which I didn't know about, beginning in the mid-decade that she calls the Hope Crusades. And these were USAID-sponsored projects partnering with the governments in these countries and local business elites. Um, and in Jordan, Queen Rania was involved and it was called the Culture of Hope campaign, launched in 2005. And it was, the campaign was designed by Sachi and Sachi. There was an I Love Life campaign in Lebanon in 2006, also designed by Sachi and Sachi, uh, involving billboards, t-shirts, buttons, pop, pop concerts, and costing one and a half million dollars. And there was a Culture of Optimism um, campaign in Egypt, she says, in 2008. So, and all of them were directed at combating what was presented as a culture of despair or pessimism that was holding back the Arab world, like you say, the awakening, right? So they were in a culture of death, pessimism, they were turning to Islamism, so we need to give them better attitudes, hope. <laughs> And, uh, you know, so it's not about inequality, it's not about neoliberalism, it's not about the regimes, it's not about U.S. intervention, and they targeted youth. So I'm knowing that, and then I'm seeing, saying, seeing you saying, I want democracy <laughs> on Facebook, and I'm scared, you know. And I know that's way too simple, but I wondered if there was, you know, you could help me think a little bit about where that might have had an impact, what it might have done, or is it just the regime and like you know, a few people got involved in it? But just thinking about the larger class elements and who, who shapes the language of which groups that were involved in this thing, which was very big. So I don't know if that's too big, but uh, yeah, it's just, really I, puzzling to me, and um, I'm sure you can think about it. Okay, I want an hour just to say all the words I hate, you know, empower news and deconstruct all those, but no, we yeah. won't do this. Um, so we only have like three minutes. Yeah, okay, three <laughs> minutes, I'll be very quick. I think you're, you're very right in the sense it's all part of a grand narrative where this whole idea of democracy promotion of watering down those revolutions, not to be you know, about s systematic change, systemic change, but rather to be about a pacted democracy, what we do in political science in terms of, you know, it's a change of elites and it's a change uh, of rules of the game, as opposed to structural change that would allow a, a, diff a different power structure altogether when it comes to the economy, when it comes to different social groups, just a revolution as we understand it. Um, and I think I'm not, I'm not saying that this is like all part of a big uh, concerted conspiracy where someone is sitting there. But I think it's part of a hegemonic uh, um, project that has elements of forces of domination, being the, U the US money, being an elite that in, inside and outside uh, Egypt and the, and the Middle East that tends to benefit from the existing power structures in terms of a media that, that's funded by those, because the, the connections are so clear. I mean, who what's, what's thought of as non-state media in Egypt? Who fund, it's, it's Sawiris, it's the same Mobinil guy who does the, the harassment campaign, right? Who comes out on TV to speak about um, those things and creates that narrative where it's, um, and I don't think that it's a coincidence that the, the faces of, a of the revolution, you look at Time Magazine, we talked about this, they had three of my students at AUC. I think those are the only three, you know, who were present. I mean, with all due respect, but AUC students are neither representative of Egyptian youth, nor are they proportionately within those millions. We have like maybe 4,000 students altogether. Um, but when they had six, people on the Time magazine cover, three of them were um, AUC kids. American uh, University in Cairo. Yeah, <laughs> American University in Cairo. And I think 
also the focus on uh, the peaceful tools, like which which actually originated in in the U.S., like Facebook and Twitter, is also part of constructing that bigger narrative. The takes away elements of when when people were chanting "El Shaab Yurid Isqat al Nizam." The word Nizam mm -hmm. in Arabic. The youth want the regime to go. Oh, to but go. that's yeah. the thing. Uh, in Arabic, as you know, the word Nizam can mean two things. Mm -hmm. It can be the regime or it can be the system. And I think there were very clear dividing lines. There were people, the majority of the people who risked their lives and the majority of the people who were killed um, wanted to change the system. Mm -hmm. But the ones who, be, who came to, to frame the discourse were the ones who wanted to change the regime. And those mm. are two different things. And I think hmm. the, that, is, that industry of development and democracy promotion is all about changing the regime, not changing uh, the system. And hence, there is a conversion of, of interests. Um, one, one final thing, and I'll, I'll stop uh, there. Um, I've never heard of, there's someone called Gene Sharp, right? And I've, I've never heard of him. And you know that, like, I, I'm in all circles. I work with the Islamists, with the, with the socialists. Ne never heard of him. And then suddenly, a friend of mine sends me um, um, a link to an article on BBC saying how Gene, this Gene Sharp guy wrote a book um, with uh, 198 tactics, uh, peaceful tactics to overthrow governments, and how this was the inspiration of the Egyptian uh, revolution and the Arab uprising. Let alone, so I had thought, you know, some journalist. But then we had a conference at AUC, and, what, and a colleague, that I'm going to tell you the name, stands up, uh, and he's like, oh, and of course, we translated, he works in that business of the, the institutes that do peace promotion and fun things, and he's like, uh, we translated the Gene Sharp book uh, from English to Arabic. And every, all the Americans in the room, it was, we had activists and we had American scholars come, were like, yeah. And my activist friends were like, yeah, what does that mean? Because no one knows what the, what, who Gene Sharp is. Turns out that he, there's part of the whole democracy promotion thing, the whole Serbia thing. And I know, I, so I started asking around. There are seven people who had that training in the nine violence who are actually not significant in any way, shape, or form. But again, it, it boils down to becoming the Gene Sharp uh, inspired somehow or gave us direction. And I, don't where, and I don't know where to start on how much this is insulting and humiliating. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, this guy who we never, as if we're incapable of doing this, or as if there's, a, there's, a, there's that divide, as if not all humans somehow um, would, in a, in a situation when you're beating up, you'll have, you, know, you have a number of options just as a human being. You either beat them back or, you know, and hence you didn't need a genius to do this. Mm. But does it have to be, you know, the white man at the end of the day, again, promoting democracy and hence civilizing us in that way? So, um, yeah. <laughs> We're going to move from north to south now, although I'm sure a number of the issues that were addressed here about the nature of transformation, the risks of, the risks of displacing the needs for structural change with more cosmetic regime change and so forth will, uh, will arise, but I'm not going to preempt that. Penny Andrews and Jane Bennett are going to talk to us now a little bit from the other end of the continent. Wow. Um, do we have to? Yes. <laughs> Um, the things that, that, that you're talking about are so compelling and so interesting. I could have sat here for at least another three hours. Shall we talk or shall we ask them to carry on talking? <laughs> we want to hear, no, we we hear you from the chair. Hear. I'm very hierarchical. So oh, yeah, you're a lawyer. Says, right. Yeah. Okay. All right. You can. Well, I would like to talk and continue the conversation that Dr. Rampel has started this morning, which is about essentially the limits of legal change, uh, or the, yeah, the limits of, 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 of change, real societal change, uh, despite 
uh, an overarching constitutional framework. Um, what I'd like to do is maybe um, raise with you a few points and hopefully it will lead to a question. Um, before I start, let me just thank the organizers of this conference. I know lots of work go, go into a conference and I really thank you all, everybody who was involved. Um, I think the, the listening, I'm gonna follow up with some of what you'd said. You mentioned the word revolution often. Um, my own writing and just looking at the South African transition, which was a legal revolution, um, for me sort of signified to the world that post-1989, since the collapse of the Eastern European uh, uh, economies, that we think about, the, the, the language of rights has essentially become sort of revolutionary la language. Um, we don't think about um, redistribution, which is what revolution, I think, entails. We talk about rights. And I think that since 1989, the possibilities of change have largely been um, regulated by constitutions and the language around rights. There have been um, uh, some compelling uh, narratives about uh, the lingua franca of progressive politics being the language of human rights. So I think to start off, there's this particular frame within which there's change, and South Africa demonstrates that the best. South Africa's constitution is by far the most progressive constitution, and I don't have time to say why, but I just want to make a, a few points. The one is the extraordinary grounds of protection that the constitution embraces, not just on the basis of race and gender, sexuality, and so on. The second is, is, is that the constitution, the reach of the constitution goes beyond relationships between the government and its citizens, but also between citizens themselves. So I think that recognizing subordination and discrimination within um, private relationships is very important. But the third is, is the way that the South African Constitution actually um, reaches out to the international arena and mandates courts and bodies in South Africa to um, take account of international and foreign law. Um, so for me, when I think about, and this is the question that I guess I want to raise with Jane, and maybe to include you in the conversation, really is um, the spaces that legal change, that, that laws and policies create um, uh, in the face of sort of extra legal impediments. I think that, um, again, I don't have time here to show how the laws, the new constitution has actually created some change, limited change, um, but also to show how difficult it is to, for the law to intervene in extra legal impediments like culture, very broadly defined, uh, socioeconomic um, uh, poverty um, that Dr. Rampella mentioned this morning. I think that the South African Constitution created the possibilities for change. What we have so far is exchange. But I think that, so I'd like to hear maybe the, the possibilities that this legal infrastructure and edifice has created for activism on the ground. Thanks, Penny. And I also need to begin, as everybody has, by saying what an honor it is to, to be here and to thank Janet Jacobson and the BCRW and um, the Africana Studies Department at Barnard Kim Hall for, um, for inviting me to be here. I must say, in the last couple of days, I've been having quite, quite a difficult time with myself. Um, the last time I met Penny Andrews was in 1985, when we were jointly in different places, angled in a very, very cold winter on the steps of Hamilton Hall at Columbia, and part of what was, what was it, two weeks, three weeks protest. It was a student protest around Columbia's um, investment policies, which at the time were supporting um, a range of relationships to the apartheid government. It was part of the divestment campaign. And she spoke, I remember her, I remember her very clearly. And I also remember um, oh, it was cold, being on those <laughs> stairs and becoming more and more depressed 
by the ways in which a certain South African political history was being told. Not only were the banners of Mandela and Stephen Biko interchangeable, it didn't seem to matter um, which one was flying at which point, um, but the ways in which the narratives of the then, this is the mid 80s, resistance movements were being told were being told as though they were stories in which there were no people gendered as women. There were no people in the trade unions. There were no people working in a whole range of relationships to military cadership or to organization within national spaces. And I knew for a fact that wasn't true. I knew it wasn't true. Um, in very profound ways, I knew it wasn't true. And one of the things I did one evening was walk across. I was a Columbia graduate student. I survived. Um, here I am. Um, um, I'm much nicer now. Oh, they're nicer. Oh, wow. How did that happen? Um, that that I, uncov I, I met the... Barnard Women for Research on Women. Tema Kaplan was its director at the time. And at 8 p.m. in the evening, there were a whole lot of young women of many, many different backgrounds sitting on the table, cross-legged, furiously forming something they called the Feminist Union. The two spaces didn't speak to one another. They didn't speak to one another. And yet here I am now, with spaces speaking to the meaning of feminism and the meaning of revolution within African contexts that have invited me to be part of that and the extraordinariness of the occasion. I am getting to your question, but I have to say this, I have to. Um, for me, was marked this morning by the fact that if you don't like what I'm about to say, you have Dr. Rampele to blame for it because when I returned to Cape Town, I vowed to have nothing to do with universities. Nothing, I was gonna grow trees. Um, I was privileged enough to be a researcher on a project she was running, which revolutionized an approach to equal opportunity and research at the University of Cape Town. And 16 years later, there I still am. Thank you, to, thank you to Dr. Rampele for instituting the African Gender Institute, for insisting that from its genesis, its ambition was to work with a pan-continental vision. I mean, what it meant for women across, and men, with particular sets of social justice initiatives to work across borders. You know, when I came into South Africa in 1992, South Africans still thought, some of them still do, that the continent ended at the Limpopo. The notion that we were part of a vibrant, rich space from which South Africans needed to learn is something that Dr. Rampele taught me and which I'm honored to continue to be part of on the North-South. Now. So the legal spaces opened up by this notion of a legal revolution. The legal revolution was also, of course, a legal compromise. And there would be many ways in which we could explore what it means to have a legal revolution and how voices do get excluded of necessity in the possibility of that kind of coalition. And Penny has written quite a lot about this that is brilliant and important. What I would say is that when I'm in a space where I'm asked to talk about legal spaces for opportunity, I quite often challenge, and I might do that later on now, challenge the, the borders that are set by that conversation. Can we only talk, for example, about gaps between law and implementation? Yes, that's a necessary conversation. Is it a sufficient conversation? Is it a sufficient conversation in which to describe the possibilities of an economic revolution 
within South African space. However, when I'm in spaces in which no legal opportunities have been opened up, then the conversation becomes a little different. And I would want to say, even knowing what I know about what's happened within South Africa to people who are poor, to people who are getting poorer, what has happened to people who've crossed our borders in relation to forced economic migration, what happens to lesbian and gay and transgendered peoples in the country, even knowing that, I still want to say a legal space that was opened up constitutes the meaning of the vote. That it is impossible to imagine a revolution that doesn't take as its base premise the right to articulate one's presence politically within the state. And because I have lived through and I know many people who have died not being allowed to live through the conditions in which that was not the case. And because I've also been somebody who's learned a lot from reading about the histories of enslavement and the meanings of moving through your own 19th century in which millions, millions of First Nation peoples died. I think a lot about what it means to have no route to recognition whatsoever. So I would say that compromised as it is, the vote offers a very important space. And alongside that, some other very important spaces have opened up, particularly in relation to issues of health, the possibilities of fighting, for example, for the right to antiretrovirals, which was not guaranteed within South Africa in the late 90s through the early noughties. Noughties is a silly word. Um, that was, in fact, addressed through the courts. That was a very, very important possibility opened up by the law. But Penny, you've written about the limitations as well of beginning here. So how do you see those limitations? How do you see the, um, the complications of accepting legal reform as a core platform for revolution? Um, well, you don't accept it. Oh, well, you accept it, but you see it as part of an overarching strategy. Um, before I go to the question of obstacles, you remind me of a Patricia Williams, who is a, also a legal scholar. She teaches at the law school. She wrote this book, The Alchemy of Race and Rights. And one of the things that she mentioned was that people poo-pooed this idea of you know, the civil rights struggle in this country and the rights, the legal revolution. And she said, well, you know, as a descendant of a former slave, just to be told that I have rights is so delicious that it doesn't matter if the whole superstructure. So, so your, your comment about the limitations of law. I think that the South African Constitution, and this is, this is uh, um, with respect to your question around obstacles, I think that the obstacles have to be taken as a given. But what you do is you look at the, the space that the Constitution has created. And let me just give you a very, an example that um, one of the most contested areas, uh, Dr. Uh, Rampella mentioned this morning, is this apparent conflict between um, African customary law and gender equality. I mean, the South African constitution in many ways has embraced two distinct narratives of liberation. One is feminism and the other is nationalism. And has created a compromise, surely, but has also stated unequivocally that equality and dignity are the primary principles. So that even the practice of one's culture or religion is mediated by equality. So let's, so let's, so let's think about um, just that particular area. Let's assume that, and this, this is what I've uh, 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 taken from some South African uh, uh, women who have made this point, 
you can retain culture, cultural practices within a framework that allows the dominating principle to survive. So let's say the, uh, uh, the, um, the appointment of chiefs in South Africa, African chiefs has historically been male and hereditary. Um, the, 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 the appointment contradicts the principle of equality. And in fact, the, there's been a case before the Constitutional Court in which when a female ch chief was uh, appointed, uh, uh, those who thought that this goes against African uh, tradition challenged this. And the Constitutional Court in a very decisive judgment said that that practicing one's culture and including the uh, appointment of chiefs has to conform to constitutional requirements and so therefore appointing a woman um, is constitutional. So it doesn't, it, 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 how many people, um, for how many people is this significant? I don't know the statistics but I would say fairly significant but it does say that one obstacle, a sort of, a sort of cultural uh, requirement can be accommodated within this framework. Um, I don't think that, and it may be because I'm a lawyer, that I feel optimistic that the obstacles that, um, that are part of what, the, the obstacles to legal change can occur even within legal change. So let me give you another example. The Constitution in South Africa creates the conditions for the pursuit of rights, social and economic rights, the right to housing, the right of access to education, et cetera, et cetera. That cannot happen without fundamental structural reasons. The reasons why people, people won't become, or the poverty issue in South Africa is not gonna be addressed by people going to court every year to challenge it. But the court has given the framework within which people are told that this is a fundamental right. And so even if the, 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 the obstacle cannot be overcome in the court, it can be overcome in other institutions. And this morning, Dr. Rampella spoke about legislative change. I, don't, I myself believe that the most fundamental change in any society comes through legislative change. I think courts are very limited in what they can do. They do important things. So that the representatives in parliament, the people whom South African, South African women vote for, have to take on board these fundamental questions, and they haven't done that. But that's not a problem with the legal framework, the, reg the Constitution. It's a problem with those who have been um, mandated to implement the Constitution. So I think that the obstacle is not the legal framework. That's what we're left with but to use the legal framework to remove the obstacles. In South Africa, I would say that poverty is the most, clearly the most um, um, uh, um, ubiquitous obstacle. Poverty leads to the violence. It's shown all the research that poor women are the biggest victims of the largest number of victims of violence. Um, poverty creates all kinds of obstacles for people to exercise their constitutional rights. So I think that in that kind of situation, the space that, that needs to be created has to go outside of, the constitu or outside of the courts, but within a constitutional framework that has made it very, very clear of what the Constitution is. The Constitution is a transformative document. It requires people who are elected, it requires civil society activists, it requires policymakers, it requires academics, it requires everybody in the society to act as citizens and not subjects. And that's the challenge, that's the obstacle. But I think the Constitution creates a, a, very, a, a very good framework. It is, it is, as I said, a document that provides, that says unequivocally that equality and dignity is what is going to animate all of South African society. And the question I raised with you is, I, you said that I had asked, uh, you may not have, I, I wanted to talk about the extra legal spaces. Mm -hmm. Not the legal yeah. spaces. But maybe I can, maybe I can make yes. a, a connection. And because, because we've got relatively little time, I'm, I'm selecting um, among a number of possible issues that I'd like to pick up in relation to what you've said. I personally um, am very much in two minds. 
about the relationship of the so-called traditional versus the constitutional um, discourses. On the one hand, as Dr. Rampele said this morning, um, there are certain ways in which our relationship as South Africans to customary law places us in very, very delicate relationships to the meaning of rights. And this is, in fact, a situation shared, in fact, across most of the globe, um, that certainly within all African countries, there are at least two and sometimes three formal, verging on sometimes a little bit more informal, systematicities of legalized relationships to embodiment and property and homes. And this negotiation between those spaces is very familiar to those of us who've, who've lived in them for the last, for the last 40, 40 years or so. So while, I, and I also feel uncomfortable about a complete split between the idea of the customary and the idea of the constitutional. As one of my colleagues, I'm sure you know her, Sibongile Ndashe, um, a lawyer, South African feminist activist lawyer, points out that the constitution in South Africa was made as much through debate and mentalities and imaginations of people who are African as customary law. Um, certainly different influences, different times, different moments, but it's not as though anybody who wrote that constitution wasn't entirely engaged in the meaning of being continentally located. So sometimes that split can, can be used in quite um, troubling ways, although at other times it's a division that people actually have to negotiate in ways that are very painful. For example, trying to access property on widowhood or things like that. But that's not what I wanted to talk about. What I wanted to talk about was a space in which, sorry, um, meow, um, in which actually the legal space created by the Constitution, three minutes, okay, one minute, because you must have two of them. Um, and subsequent legislation has made very, very, very little impact on the lives of ordinary South Africans. And when you say ordinary South African, basically you mean poor. That's, that's how the figures look. That's, um, and different relations to poverty. We could go on a whole spiel about that and it would be important because the word poor doesn't begin to describe the range of possible relations to resourcelessness. Um, and that's, that's worth doing. But people who live their lives as lesbian, gay, and transgendered, which also not, ought not to be in a single additive phrase, um, but here we go, one minute. Um, do not live lives that are protected by the constitutional protection against discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation. They do not, they do not, they do not at all. They live lives unless they are privileged enough to buy a certain temporal relation to security through class and race, they are deeply, deeply, deeply vulnerable. So vulnerable that I opened my email this morning to find the news of another 24-year-old lesbian murdered in Quatema, the second this year. However, I want to end on a positive note, hee <laughs> hee, yes I do. Because if legal revolution is not sufficient, and it's not, and we need to go back to what Dr. Ampele was suggesting this morning about the power of the ordinary conversation. One of those that I've had in the last two months was with a group of people called the One in Nine Project. They came together 
during the time of the trial for our current president, Jacob Zuma, for alleged rape. The woman who accused him, her pseudonym is Kwesi. She had had to leave the country afterwards. Um, for those who are recording, um, he was found innocent. Um, I said it. He was found innocent. And I was in a meeting where she had come back into the country for a particular meeting of organizing around the possibility of reimagining the safety for the bodies of young, often black, mostly black, working class, poor women and men. One of the things one of the organizers asked us to do, I was facilitating the meeting, I was scared. Um, it, was, it was a hectic, hectic, hectic space. I didn't know if I was big enough for that moment. But before we began, the woman who'd spearheaded the treatment action campaigns, insistence on recognizing the importance of people gendered as women as fundamental to thinking about the need for AZT, asked us to stand up and to put our fists in the air and to sing the national anthem. We all sort of looked at each other. And then we did it. And it was the first time in about 10 years in my country that I've known what the hell it was that I was doing. Those were the people who were going to be organizing for the meaning of the future. Those were the people who had the right to the anthem. I was very privileged to be there. It was an extra legal space. And let me ask what you think about that. Well, actually, I, uh, maybe we could do so privately because I think that people in this room probably have some very interesting questions or comments, and we have such few few minutes. So maybe at dinner, you and I can. But yep. so I, I cede my well, my time to. We, we are Sorry, we, we started very late. We are a little bit short of time. So I do think it would be a good opportunity for us to bring together questions that have been gathering in your own minds. There are some very strong resonances between the, the, the two ends of the continent, what I wrongly called a north-south relation, but what we can properly call a south-south relation in terms of the dissonance between legal transformation and social structure transformation. And in terms of the task that we all as people in a university face, which is um, engaging in that activism, which is our daily bread, namely changing minds, teaching, doing the work of unlearning the ideological structures that make us accept things that are not yet sufficient to social justice. So let's get some questions. I will take one or uh, two or three questions at a time. There are people with microphones uh, walking about, so please put your hand up. They'll identify you. We'll gather two or three questions. And, and then, of course, the panelists can also join in with their own questions. Thank you very much uh, for, for this wonderful panel. I wanted to ask uh, Rava and Marie two, two, two questions. One, this is activism and academia. And I come from Latin America, and there academia has been very powerful with activism. Subcomandante Marcos, the Zapatista head, was an academic in UNAM and another university. So the relation to put the world upside down has been hand in hand and mind in mind and body in body with academia. So I want to know in Egypt, what is the place of thinking through universities, public ones? That is one thing. And the other, Egypt, this year, was the first country that overflowed the plazas, the squares. Then came Spain, the outrage, the outrage, los indignados, this movement of the outrage, not only rage, outrage, which is very different. How do you see Egypt in this concert of overflowing squares and plazas, Madrid, and then um, Cairo, of course, and Tunis, and then the whole world. 
Okay, I'm going to I'm going to um, add these questions together. Can um, Anne, can you right. address your question too? Thank you. First, I want to thank the panel for an incredibly stimulating conversation. I could happily sit here and listen to you talk for a lot longer. So thank you. Um, and my, it's a question for the entire panel, and it was inspired first by the conversation between Lila and Rabib that brings up the issue of public feelings. And I was struck, and in some sense, this is an obvious point, but it's often good to be reminded of the obvious. Um, the, the doc democracy promotion projects are you know, absolutely um, of a piece with the prosecution of the global war on terror. So the culture of optimism is, if you just think about the war on feelings declared on the war on terror, right? I mean, what does it mean to declare a war on a feeling? And the, the idea of creating or cultivating a culture of optimism is still about the production of particular forms of um, affective animation, right? You're supposed to be animated in the right way in accord with um, a, a neoliberal aspiration, or at least um, you're supposed to be aligned with it so you will accept a certain position in relation to it. And you know, hope crusades is also a rather um, overly burdened term. So that got me thinking about the question of the extra legal um, in the South African context, and I wonder if there's a way to sort of think about the question, again, the politics of public feelings and how they're worked by USAID or um, in these specific national sites by both extra-legal and legal mechanisms. But in the South African context, it got me thinking about the Truth and Reconciliation um, Commission and that process, and the, the really important shift in what the term reparation has come to mean. So if at an earlier moment, we could think of reparation as being about a material redistribution of resources, reparation has come to mean, I think, more, it's started to turn inward to be about a psychological change. And I'm, you know, I'm totally in favor of psychoanalytic and psychological understandings of reparation. Uh, anyone who knows my work would find it surprising if I were not. But what happens when these two things are pulled apart? So the only kind of reparation you're allowed to have is one that somehow, again, a reconciliation of yourself to existing systemic conditions. Okay, so uh, three questions. One about the changing nature of reparation and the displacement of perhaps more material transformation by, by purely psychic reconciliation, a question about the nature of the uh, academy and the university in the, in the uh, recent political uh, movements in Egypt, and also about uh, the phenomenon of um, spillage out of public spaces or the transformation of public spaces. I will add one question to that, and I'll allow you to all respond, which is a very basic question, uh, namely, how can we save ourselves from substituting a mere tracing of origins of discourse for a judgment of those discourses. That is, is it enough to say that the discourse of hope has been mobilized by or per, per, uh, pervaded by commercial interests? Is that enough to judge the question of, for example, animating political will? Um, I think we're all probably equally comfortable with the attribution or the, uh, the accusation of culpability uh, with commercial interests who clearly are purveying hope for other reasons. Consumerism tends to go up. But how can we separate out that judgment from the other judgments that we all make, namely concern about political apathy, for example, disaffection with our processes, um, a sense of the incapacity to effect political change? How to not allow the tracing of origins to be the totality of the judgment of what we encounter. So these are questions that I think we'll start with Laila and, and, and uh, Rabab, and uh, we'll follow up with the South Africans, and they should cross all domains, yeah? I'll just, um, I'll, no, I'll just, uh, I'll just focus on the um, universities and academia, because I think uh, this is something that I, um, I feel sort of guilty that I didn't mention um, in, in our conversation. Um, again, one of the one of the problems with this grand narrative of the Arab Revolution and Awakening is that, as I said, it assumes that nothing has been uh, going on. And I think what we saw that uh, winter was actually a culmination of ruptures in different um, forms and the. The academic sphere, that space of academia, was not um, far away from those uh, ruptures. So during the past uh, decades, specifically since 2003, we've had something called the March um, 9th Movement um, for Independence of Universities. And that's basically, uh, it has membership from all um, 
faculty across uh, the country campuses, uh, in Cairo and outside, um, very few from the American University in Cairo. And again, we can talk about neoliberalization of the education and what it does, and trying to understand that campus supposedly as uh, a liberal education institution with freedom of speech, but that's a different thing. Uh, I'm being reviewed for tenure, uh, so yeah. Uh, um, but anyways, um, it, it had um, a lot of uh, Egyptian university uh, faculty members, and basically it was, um, a lot of them were engaged in other uh, spaces of struggle and activism, be it the pro-democracy movement or feminists like our common friend, Aydis, if that would, um, and I'm, Islamists were there, secular, uh, and I think it was very important because it did um, two things. It was it was um, bringing uh, the bigger issues of macro political change to campus, but it was also putting on the agenda of systematic change things like independence of research, like funding, like social equality in terms of pay and salaries um, on university campuses in terms of appointment of uh, deans and who, who gets uh, to be on the faculty, that this is not a transparent project, that this, it's been policed um, so tightly that it's very difficult to have certain political um, trends and certain forms of activism um, uh, represented. Uh, and I think all of this um, has been important and they, they were present, and again, on Tahrir Square, let's let's again not reduce everything to Tahrir Square, but, but just that's where I was physically. Um, we had uh, a booth or a stand for the March 9 uh, movement throughout the 18 days. Um, and as, as we're speaking now, uh, there are uh, faculty strikes being organized in order not, look, not to look only at economic um, issues, which I think are integral to the, to the economic, uh, to, to the Egyptian revolution, but also at issues, as I said, of who gets appointed and how. And I think what neoliberalism has done um, throughout the past decade is that there were two pillars. One is a very policed um, state that has to protect and, and keep all the economic injustices in place and checked um, somehow. And again, um, a very small elite that has a, the political and economic concentrated power in their hands. And what something like March 9th movement is doing is, is trying to restructure the academic sphere in a way that it, first of all, it takes the whole policed element of the campuses as a physical space, as, as much as intellectually, um, but also to re-question um, things like economic uh, justice and transparency in, in forms of governance, uh, so to speak, uh, within that sphere. Penny, did you want to speak? Well, I'll just, just, just two, just quickly, two, two uh, responses. The question about um, the TRC as sort of, and reparations as internal redistribution of resources. Um, I think that um, certainly this morning, Dr. Rampel, and if one reads the TRC, it was very limited in what it could do and what it in fact did do because of the, the focus only on gross violations of human rights and the number of victims. I mean, only 22,000 people were identified as victims. Arguably, there were millions and millions and millions of victims. So I think that to think about it in economic terms, you know, is, 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 it just doesn't work. With respect to psychological, and I don't know about the um, campaigns of the culture of, op uh, what's it, optimism hope. and so on? Hope. hope. Optimism. Um, I think a different question that I think is, 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 is this idea of psychological liberation, which uh, the black consciousness movement in South Africa um, certainly was, was, was articulated at some point, and that is, I, when I look at South Africa, particularly violence against women, I see the way in which Maybe there has to be a psychological revolution. People have, I think, internalized hierarchies of race and gender that's difficult to dislodge. So the TRC, if it can create the space for um, reconciliation that's very, very broadly defined, which is about um, you know, what Franz Fanon and so on, sort of this idea of completely liberating your mind and spirit. 
So that's how I see the TRC. Um, the incapacity to effect political change, I'm going to leave it to Jane. It's a long, <laughs> large question, and, and I'm a legal barbarian. I've already shown my limitations. I, wasn't, I, I was asking how can, we, how can we get away from tracing origins as the limit form of our critique? That is, we know that a lot of this stuff, you know, I mean, human rights can appear like the worst thing that ever happened to the world because it is an instrument used to leverage very uh, radically unequal systems and to leverage and to limit the flow of capital and so forth. On the other hand, we don't want to be in a position of saying human rights are bad. I mean, I think this is the, this is, you know, the, the necessity of legal, constitutional, and legislative change as the insufficient but absolutely necessary basis, I think, is sometimes feels like it can be in contradiction to the critical projects that we rightly undertake when we follow the flows of these discourses and, and rightly are suspicious that they're being touted as much by corporate entities as by grassroots organizations and so forth. So it's a task, a broad task for all of us in terms of our own pedagogy, in terms of our own critical labor, and in terms of what, as I said, what we do as teachers, this, the business of changing minds, and not allowing that when it came from there and therefore there's nothing in it for us. I mean, I think we have to work with broken instruments. But we also have to be, I mean, the question raised about, uh, uh, you know, the, the academy and activism, people have to be hungry. I look at the universities, some universities, the elite universities in apartheid South Africa, and I look at them today, and I don't see the young, the, the hunger that, and I may be, you know, so of my age, but when I was at university, there was certainly a hunger to overthrow apartheid and so on. I, I think that there's not a hunger, and people, uh, you know, I, I go to South Africa regularly, I'm surprised that there are people who say, second year BA students, well, you know, that was, history, apartheid was history, and just sort of caught up in this culture of consumerism. And I don't blame people because they are activists, I'm, I'm not saying that, but I think the broader hunger for change has shifted. And uh, Egypt, I kind of, I, I sort of hope that that hunger stays because, <laughs> you know, that is ultimately what's going to animate the kinds of changes that you talk about. Roslyn. Yeah, I, I mean, unfortunately, I'm in, I'm in this uh, unpleasant position of having to close off a conversation that could probably go on for, for many hours, and maybe will, and coffee shops and so forth. And I'm not usually Pollyanna, as those of you who know me know. But nonetheless, I think the, you know, the, the, the conversations, the questions that we heard from among students this weekend are all the indication that we can have right now, and it's a good indication that there are, there are people whom we can trust some of this labor to. Uh, for the future. I'm going to hand the um, last moments of closure to Janet Jacobson, I think, who is standing on the peripheries. But thank you to our excellent panelists.